In this video, we will introduce op amps. It is chapter 22. The schematic symbol is just a triangle. And inside that triangle is a pre-engineered amplifier all ready to go. It's actually a differential amplifier. There are two inputs, a non-inverting input and an inverting input designated with a plus and a minus. Those are not power supply connections, those are inputs. And then there's an output from the amplifier. And the way it operates is it'll <clears throat> amplify the difference between the two inputs. And the difference can be very small uh, because the amplification is really high um, in terms of 100,000 gain is typical for an op amp. Also, for the schematic symbol, it doesn't matter which input is on the top and which is on the bottom as far as the schematic orientation. The rule is generally whatever is more convenient to keep the schematic neat. So um, you'll see it sometimes like that. You'll see it maybe with the non-inverting input on top and the with the inverting input on top and the non-inverting input on the bottom. Either way is fine. The pre-engineered uh, amplifier that's sitting inside the op amp uh, oftentimes uh, is a you know two-stage, three or three-stage amplifier. The first stage uh, many times is a if it is a differential amplifier uh, referred to sometimes as a long tail pair. It's a configuration we uh, haven't seen, and um, let's see if I move this out of the way. Is that in the screen? And uh, here you see it. It looks like uh, two uh, common emitter amps that share a common uh, common emitter resistor here, uh, a, a common emitter resistor. So uh, just to give you a little idea, we don't have to understand all these uh, details, but the inputs that you see in the triangle are really the inputs here, one of them's inverting, one's not, depending where you take the output up here. It's going to work itself through some circuitry, maybe a second stage. Uh, there's going to be um, things like current mirrors and um, constant current sources and things like that, um, active loads. Um, it's, so it's going to be a, constructed to be a really high gain amp. You, with a long tail pair like this, you already get a good jump start on high gain. And then with some things like active loads and so on, you get even higher gain. The output is many times coming right from uh, something we would also recognize as um, our familiar push-pull uh, output here. Um, and that would be right here. Uh, here is a representative schematic of the LM358 from the manufacturer. I'm not showing us all the detail, but... Um, this would be um, maybe some of the uh, components. You can see that um, maybe the inputs are sitting here. They're coming into the base. Here's our long tail pair. A little harder to recognize. It, it, it uses um, uh, constant current sources and active loads, I think. So uh, it's going to go through a couple stages. We're finally going to get to the output. Where's the output here? Ah, here. Here's our output, and um, your Q11, Q13, there's our push-pull output. Of course, the nice thing with a prepackaged op amp, we don't have to go into all this analysis and design. That's That hard work has been done for us, and um, so we, we have it all pre-made, ready to go. Um, like we said, the, the, the two inputs uh, and your output but you can also see for that push-pull output, you're going to need the two rail voltages. If you remember back to when we did um, sort of discrete amplifiers. So this would be the positive rail VCC. This would be the negative rail VEE. Um, this op amp, the 358, it can run off of a dual supply or a single supply. So, for example, you could put... Um, five volts here and zero volts here, and then it would be VCC and ground, and it'll run okay with that. 
um, some trickery going on there, I guess, in, in the circuitry uh, to make that happen. And then um, you can also put positive volts here and a negative voltage here, like positive five volts of VCC and negative five volts of VEE. And um, it'll run just fine with that too. And we look at the data sheet and, and see what the ranges of voltage uh, are. You know, there'd be a maximum and a minimum uh, power supply voltage for this chip. So that multi-stage amplifier circuitry is all tucked inside here. And you know, I have to worry about it from now on. Just so you know, it's not entirely magic. We can put the rail voltage uh, supply pins here and here on a schematic. Um, they may or may not be present. Um, it's assumed you got to bring power to the chip, so um, they don't always include these on the schematic. But here, here's where we would have our VEE or or ground, right? We said it can operate on a single supply. Not all op amps can. Some op amps can only operate on a dual supply. And then this would be VCC. And there would be our five pins. I think that's all we need for the rail voltages. Uh, again, if you remember back to when we were doing some simple discrete amplifiers, it's a good idea to hold those voltages um, stable, steady, um, maybe some decoupling caps to um, you know, shunt noise to ground. So things like that, we might or might not have to employ, but um, if you're gonna put some small size caps in, you know, maybe 0.1 microfarads or 0.1 or 0.01, I kind of forget which we used. <clears throat> and they should be fairly close to the as close as possible to the, the pin of the chip. And then um, another thing that helps stabilize those rail voltages is um, a larger cap, um, an electrolytic, maybe 100 microfarads. So if I can squeeze that in here. Um, maybe 100 microfarads. <clears throat> and I held off on this one because you have to be careful here um, which way to put the electrolytic cap in, right? So which side is more negative? Um, it's going to be, uh, VEE is going to be a negative supply voltage compared to common. So make sure you don't miss that. The, the uh, 100 microfarad cap on the negative rail, of course the negative side of the cap has to go against the rail. And that'll be marked on the capacitor with negative signs. Um, it's also the side that is uh, that the, the outside metal can. Um, if you don't get the polarity right, you know what happens. You have a little firecracker instead of a capacitor. Those 100 microfarad uh, caps give a nice uh, local supply of current um, for the amplifier. If it needs to do a quick uh, you know, change in the output, it can pull current uh, from those caps as opposed to having those um, quick pulses of current traveling all the way through uh, longer wires from, from a power supply. Um, so it's good to have that local sort of reservoir of uh, coulombs ready to go. Uh, it helps helps the amplifier do its job and not and also not have noise in those power supply leads and so on. Our analog discovery does have a dual power supply. So that's awesome. So we can do the I think it's maximum five volts 
So we'll use that, but we can put plus five, we can put minus five, and of course, <clears throat> the third voltage is, um, will be just circuit common, um, zero volts. So we'll have <clears throat> three voltages then to power up the circuit with. Um, these rail voltages set the compliance of the amplifier, just like we saw in earlier days. Uh, the output signal can go as high as five volts, actually not quite because there's internal circuitry here that's going to use up some of the voltage. So the truth is, though, they do set the compliance. You're not going to be able to get all the way to the rail voltages, but the output voltage can swing uh, within maybe a volt or, or two, depending on, on the current that you draw on the output. So if you're not drawing much current on the output, you won't have as much IR drop internally. Maybe you can get to four volts of, of, of the five volt rail. So, and, and down here, again, if you're not drawing much current, maybe you can get to four volts in this direction. So your compliance would maybe be eight volts with a, um, with a plus and minus five. Four volts in each direction. Remember, compliance is always peak to peak uh, output capability. Um, and if you were pulling more current on the output, you could maybe only get to three volts because the IR drop internally. So um, your compliance might drop to six volts three volts in either direction. We won't be putting a heavy load on the output, and there's other reasons not to put a heavy load on the output that we'll talk about. Um, but um, so we will be putting, not drawing much current, so we should have a compliance of that's close to eight volts if we power it with plus and minus five, and we can certainly check that with our scope. And here is the chip that we'll be using. It's the LM358. It actually has two op amps inside of it of the IC. It's an 8-pin IC. And you can see you've got uh, one op amp here with um, your inputs, the inverting, the non-inverting input, and the output pin one. Both uh, op amps share the supply that's that's uh, given to, to pin eight and pin four. Um, if you're only using one op amp, then you want to always remember to uh, ground the other op amps inputs. Take them to zero volts. So we had said that the uh, op amp inside uh, contains a multi-stage amplifier ready to go and if you remember I mentioned it's really high gain um, in the order of a hundred thousand even which means it's, it's going to do the differential amplifier thing where it's going to amplify any difference between these two inputs so even if there's just millivolts difference, like one millivolt difference, yeah, just one millivolt times 100,000, you can see the output would be 100 volts peak. And, well, we're not going to get to 100 volts. Our rail voltages only let us get to four. It'd be clipping right away. So it would just give you a high level if there's even a millivolt difference. I mean, even if there's, um, you know, a fraction of a millivolt difference. Uh, so with, it, with such high gain, this thing's going to go to clipping, it seems, immediately. Uh, in that application, it would be a comparator. It's just going to compare the two inputs, and whichever input's greater, it's going to use its high amplification to uh, slam the input, uh, slam the output to, to the rail to, to indicate. So, I mean, if the, if the, if the inverting input uh, was greater, we would head, uh, the output would go straight to the, uh, the negative rail. If you want to get that mental association, maybe it's better if we flip these again. It, like I said, it doesn't matter which is which uh, as far as the drawing goes. So I like to always uh, make sure we understand from the start how this thing operates in what's called open loop. There's, there's no feedback yet. We're going to get to that. But um, this would just be open loop, and what happens is it... The, the, um, the op amp would be operating like a comparator, and it's going to take uh, whichever input is greater, it's, the output's going, it's going to send the output um, to that rail. Uh, so if the, if, the, if the inverting input here uh, would be greater than the non-inverting input, this, this minus input is greater than the plus input. If this one's winning, the output will indicate by going to the negative rail. 
If this one's winning, the output will be pegged against the upper rail. And again, within a volt, so it'll head to negative four volts, and that would be our output signal that indicates that this input is greater, and a positive four volts would indicate this input's greater. So a gain of 100,000, not practical for, for using it as an amplifier, very good for using it as a comparator. And what we have to do is tame that gain. We have to use what's called negative feedback to, to squash that gain down to something that's um, practical to use as an amplifier. So the way we're going to do that is uh, a voltage divider, our favorite mechanism of all time, right? Just can't get away from voltage dividers. So a voltage divider is going to take some amount of the output and feed it back to the inverting input where it will cancel with the signal. So because the inverting input has a canceling effect. So, um, so we'll show you some designs and these, uh, if you want to take a com uh, an op amp and uh, turn it into an amplifier that can be used, you use uh, negative feedback which is simply a voltage divider bringing a portion of the output through voltage division back to the inverting input, whereby whatever amount you bring back is going to cancel with the signal and reduce the gain. So this negative feedback to control the gain of an amplifier is, um, is used a lot. And, and for op amps, it's, op amps, it's the main, main mechanism we'll use, to, and it's a simple one uh, to use to control gain. If you remember when we were doing discrete amps, we, uh, we nicknamed the one uh, session that we were doing uh, no pain, no gain, because you know it took us the whole theory session just to calculate the gain of a discrete uh, CE amplifier. You know, you had to go through the DC bias and find out ICQ and then, and then use the Shockley relationship um, to estimate the bulk resistance and and then add up the AC collector resistance and the, and the AC emitter resistance with the AC equivalent circuit. And once you have that ratio, you finally have the gain. So we, over the years, we've nicknamed, uh, you'll see when we do the, the simple two resistor voltage divider that's used to bring a certain amount of the output back to cancel via the inverting input. That's all there is to it. Just, just those two resistors and you and you know the gain. So you'll see that we're going to do that in a minute. Uh, but we nicknamed this session uh, No Pain, Lots of Gain because it's a piece of cake. Uh, they're they're, they're kind of like the Legos of amplifiers because, well, they're already, all the hard work's already done. Okay, so let's get started on turning this op amp with super high gain into a practical amplifier. Um, it's a differential amplification uh, where it amplifies the difference between the two. So what we're going to do is hold one of the inputs at zero volts, and then we can bring a signal in to the other input, and as the signal is above zero volts, it'll get amplified, and as it's below zero volts, it'll get amplified. So <clears throat> this will turn it into um, maybe what we would call a single-ended uh, amplifier, um, we'll tie one of them to common. <clears throat> and we mentioned we have to find a way to squash the gain down. We're gonna use voltage divider to feed back some of the uh, output signal back to this inverting input. So um, easy to remember, that's called RF because it's the feedback resistor. Let me make that a little clearer for you. Okay. <clears throat> so RF is one of the resistors in the voltage divider. That won't work by itself because look, uh, RF um, would just be a, a, a certain amount of impedance, but it would just feed all of the voltage back. And we'll get to that. Uh, you can do that. And actually it doesn't kill the gain down to zero. It reduces the gain to approximately one. Um, so that's known as a buffer and, and we'll get to that. Uh, but yeah, if you bring all of the output back to the inverting input, I know intuitively it might seem like that's going to kill the gain completely and get it down to zero. Uh, it actually reduces the gain to one, 
and that is known as a buffer or a voltage follower. It's, um, it's the equivalent of when we were doing uh, discrete BJT amplifiers. It's, it's the equivalent of a, of a common collector amplifier that, that doesn't have any voltage gain, but you can use it to, for current gain or as a buffer. But we don't want to reduce the gain all the way down to one, which is what this would do. And in fact, well, getting ahead of myself, but you don't even need a resistor. You can just take a, a straight wire and bring it around. Um, so uh, that's possible too. Okay, getting ahead of myself there, but let's try to do our practical amplifier. So the other part of our uh, voltage divider, obviously we need another resistor and that will go here. And this is known as RI because oftentimes, uh, in this case, we're going to bring our input signal right in here. And there we go. We now have an amplifier just that quickly, which is again why kind of we nickname these as the Lego. We're kind of in the Lego world now. Somebody else has done all the hard work. We just get to play with it. It already fits together really nicely. And the no pain, lots of gain thing happens. It's no pain, very easy to get whatever gain you want. Uh, check this out. The gain is just RF over RI. Sweet, right? Don't hate me for dragging you through discrete amps. No, but, uh, but they all have their applications. Um, as, as, as difficult as it is to do a discrete common emitter amplifier, perhaps, that's still used, so you don't want to not have done that. But isn't this a breath of fresh air, or just it's, it's just easy, right? So it's nice to have some things that are easy. Of course, I think you remember... Um, gain is just how much larger the output signal is than the input. If it's voltage gain, uh, it's uh, we will look at V out compared to V in, and we'll look at that with our scopes. And so we can predict the gain here, theoretically, and uh, <laughs> we can predict it in 30 seconds, right? Uh, take this resistor, divide it by this resistor, you have your answer for what the gain should be. Uh, not the whole theory session that it took previously. And at the bench, just put your scope on the output, one channel on the output, one channel on the input, and you've got your comparison to prove that it's working properly. And as always, you're turning into a technician when you do that. There aren't necessarily answer keys in the real world. This is your answer key. Does the theoretical calculation match the measured value? then it's working properly. And you can go to lunch. Here I've just drawn in the, the scope connections. Uh, just to remind you, of course, it's, it's, it's the analog discovery that has the differential channels. So, you know, channel one plus uh, a channel one can go right here. Of course, the minus of channel one can go to circuit common. Uh, and then it'll be looking at your input signal. The common for the analog discovery is shared with circuit common. So all three of those are important to make. You have to, you have to get all three of those wires from your analog discovery over. Um, and it even might seem silly, but that's the way it is. You got to have the common to the circuit common and channel one to, um, to circuit common. And then the same thing for looking at the output, of course, channel two, uh, the plus of channel two uh, heads right to the output and the minus has to go to circuit common. So you got a couple sort of seemingly redundant, but um, uh, nevertheless necessary because like we said, the channels for the scope channels for the analog discovery are differential. So they need, they need to know what they're comparing to between, it's gonna measure the difference between here and here. What the analog discovery is actually doing, sidebar is, it's got four single-ended channels. Uh, and so it's really measuring the voltage here with reference to common and here with reference to common. And then it's taking this minus this. Okay. Anyway, but there they are just as a reminder, because of course our bench scopes are just uh, um, single ended channels. So we're not used to always having to hook two things up. So I just wanted to remind you of that. Um, these caps may or may not be necessary. I'm going to try it 
uh, with and without to see what I run into. Um, but, you know, not a bad idea to have them there. Then if you get a nice organized layout on your breadboard with the caps, that is, is probably good advice because they'll be there and, and we're going to do lots of exercises with op amps. Then you don't have to be wondering if, if, if there's some battle you're fighting uh, with noise or oscillation that you should have those caps. So I think we better put them in, not try to get away with it by not putting them in. Um, because we'll probably pay the price for that at some point. And that reminds me, although we might say we're playing in the Lego world when we play with these, uh, the real world will still bite us, <laughs> uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, things like um, um, little offsets and, and noise problems and stuff. So it's not entirely the Lego world. We're still, uh, we'll still have our battles to, to make things come out nice and neat. But, um, but it's, it's, it's certainly like the Lego world, you know, as far as... Um, you know, the, the, the theory and, and most of the implementation. Uh, on a good day, it does work just right away for you. So um, this negative feedback design is known as an inverting amplifier. I think you can see why um, the input signal is coming in to the inverting input, which does mean that there'll be 180 degrees uh, phase difference between the input and the output. We can also create a non-inverting amp. So let's do it. So for a non-inverting amp, we need the input to come in at the non-inverting input. Makes sense, right? So we're gonna bring it in here. This'll be our input. We still need to feed back a certain amount of the output uh, using a voltage divider. Done. How cool is that? It's Lego world, right? Now your incoming signal will still be amplified and appear at the output and we can do all, everything. There's one more change we have to make though in the theory, make a little more room here. The gain is still RF over RI with one more addition, plus one. That's easy to forget, that little plus one. So here's a memory aid. If the input signal is coming in to the plus input, right? Associate that plus with this plus, and it might help you <clears throat> to not forget that you have to add one to the game. So it's going to still be as easy as just RF and RI with this little plus one as an addition. It's not always super significant, but it is significant if your gain is low. Like if your gain is 10, um, you know, let's say we had, um, right? I mean, this is how easy this is, right? That's what's so much fun about playing with op amps. Put a 100K there and a 10K there. In the previous inverting amp, you have a gain of 10. In this amp, you have a gain of 11. So you don't want to forget that that is significant, you know, the difference between 10 and 11. Um, maybe less significant is if you have a gain of 100, right? I did that quick, didn't I? 100K, 1K. Um, now the gain for the previous amp would be 100, and the gain for the non-inverting amp would be 101, so again, maybe not as significant. But don't forget about it because if you're, you know, if you're dealing with low gains, it, it certainly is significant. Go back to this. Go back to this. Mm -hmm. So any ratio of 10 should work. I mean. A 10K and a 1K, I mean, you don't want to go too low with resistors. You start having high currents um, that are unnecessary. So you can try. You can pick your own set of resistors. Uh, I think we'll try for maybe a gain of 10 in the, in the lab exercise. Um, a gain of 10 and a gain of 11. Seems like a good thing to try for. Um, 
and like I say, you can pick whatever pair, pairing you want of resistors and try experimenting with some different ones. But um, I wouldn't go below 1K. And um, if you go too high, um, I mean, you can go to 1 meg ohm, but I mean, you start opening yourself up for noise if, um, if, you know, if, if, if you have too high of an impedance path. And one more design we'll throw in the mix to make a total of three possible configurations uh, that use negative feedback. So these would be known as negative feedback amplifiers. We had the uh, the inverting amp, the non-inverting amp. Let's do the one we actually mentioned earlier. Uh, the, the buffer, the voltage follower. Um, uh, buffer, whichever you want to call it. But it's... Um, it's going to have a gain that's approximately one, maybe a little less than one. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? And um, the input's going to stay at the non-inverting input, so it, it doesn't invert. That also sounds familiar, right? You're thinking common collector amp, um, approximately one. It doesn't invert, um, and it do. I think we mentioned the one we just did, it, it does not invert also. It'll be in phase, the input will be in phase with the output. Um, that's going to remain the case. And this one's super simple. You don't even need to dig out your resistors to do this one. You can just bring all of the output signal back to the inverting input. Remember, that's the game. you got to use the inverting input to control gain. Um, if you were to feed some of the output signal back to the non-inverting input, that will not have a canceling effect. That will have an additive effect. We will do that later. What you have then is an oscillator. It'll just keep going. It'll self-sustain. It'll bring some of the output back to the input, get amplified, come to the output, and it'll just go in a loop, <clears throat> and you have an oscillator. Exactly like what happens if you take a microphone and bring it out in front of a speaker. The speaker's output goes into the mic, goes into the amplifier, goes to the speaker, goes into the mic, and you have a, a feedback loop that's positive or reinforcing. Uh, and so uh, that would be an oscillator. Um, and that's good if you want to make an oscillator. It's bad if you don't want it to oscillate. So. Um, we're going to not want oscillation. We just want an amplifier at this point. But once you have amplification, you've set yourself up with the ability to create a feedback oscillator. Positive feedback does that for you. So um, that's the next chapter once we, once we have this. But that's a lot of fun, too. Um, if you can create um, um, oscillators as easily as amplifiers. So this negative feedback um, configuration uh, again, we mentioned before, it, 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 you just bring the output back, you would maybe intuitively think, well, that's going to kill everything. That's just going to bring it down to, to, to zero. Um, it does not. So it, it does get you a gain of approximately one, maybe slightly less. And again, we can prove that out at the bench with our scopes. Um, so these will be the three configurations we'll experiment with. You know, we'll get the chip on the board with the rail voltages and the, and the, and the, and the caps here. Um, and then we'll just play around with um, the, uh, the feedback uh, voltage divider, the RFRI, the different configurations, you know, where we bring the input into the inverting input, have an inverting amp, bring it into the non-inverting input, non-inverting amp. Um, and then, of course, the, the one we have here, the voltage follower, also known as a buffer, um, because it, it can be an impedance matching thing. I mean, let's say you have a signal that... Um, Maybe you have two things that are kind of a mismatch. Um, the thing you're connecting to the output actually requires current, but the thing you're connecting to the input, not so good at supplying current. It's more of a, a weak signal in that regard, but it has voltage. Um, so um, that would be sort of a high impedance thing going on here and maybe a lower impedance. So you can, you can put a buffer in between these two incompatible things. Um, this one requires current. This one can't supply current. And so you get the idea of this, this naming convention, buffer. Um, the buffer is something that sits between two things that can't get along. So uh, this would be that. It's not going to change it. It's going to get this 
out to here, but it's going to get this to be able to work with this. So it'll be able to get this input thing that can't supply current to to work compatibly with the uh, with the load that you're going to connect here, the thing you're going to connect here. You kind of need that for people, right? If two people can't get along, just maybe put an op amp between them, see if that works. Yeah, for each of these uh, configurations, then we'll uh, we'll test them out at the bench. I mean, do a little sketch for yourself. Always good advice to have it drawn um, so that you can, you know, think it through with pencil and paper. Have that in front of your eyes when you go to actually grab the wires, put the thing together. You never want to be uh, wiring something up while you're trying to hold the image of it in your head. I mean, that's a bad idea. It's easy to make a mistake. So, so, so do a sketch for yourself. Then um, uh, for each of for each of the three. Uh, configurations. Sketch them out, put down what resistors you're going to use, um, get the pin out of the chip, you know, print it out for yourself, um, get all your drawings done and ready and organized, then go ahead and neatly put it together on a breadboard. We'll use the analog discovery. We'll use the wave generator here, you know, to, to supply VN. Um, we should put some load on the output, um, an open might not be a great idea, so uh, let's, uh, you know, not load it very heavily, but I would say 10K on up, you know, might be a good choice. Um, 10K, um, or we can experiment with higher, I mean, we'll start with 10K, so, the, so this would be the load that we're putting on the output. And, um, you know, of course, you're, I think you know, right, <laughs> you're, you're, Scope's going to go right across that. So channel two is going to look at the output. <clears throat> Ran off the screen. Um, use scope cursors to prove out the theoretical calculations. And should be a breath of fresh and easy air. We will try each of the three configurations on the breadboard. And for each one, we'll be... Uh, looking at uh, predicting the gain with that simple uh, calculation and that, that we need, and then um, uh, measuring the gain and comparing that. Um, also, be sure to notice the phase relationship between the input and the output. should be able to predict that and should be able to observe that with your scope. I'll type up some instructions as far as what I want you to hand in. I think this covers it. I uh, hope I didn't forget anything major. If I did, I'll have to put a part two to this. <laughs> I did think of one more thing. Uh, uh, like we said, maybe we should write these down. Maybe we want to uh, predict the gain and measure the gain. We want to predict the phase relationships between the input output. Predict it and measure it. And then the thing I did remember was um, compliance. Let's have a look at that. Um, uh, again, the compliance, uh, we would predict with a 10K load, it's not going to pull too much current. We would predict a compliance of maybe 8 volts peak to peak. Um, and then we'll use cursors uh, with, on our scope to check that. Uh, compliance is um, maybe 8 volts peak to peak. Question mark. <clears throat> If you remember how to check compliance, um, you just uh, increase the input signal's uh, amplitude until the output can no longer comply with it. In other words, until you hit clipping. So when you see the flat spot occurring on the peaks, that means it can't go any higher. It's out of swing in that direction. Um, it should happen symmetrically with an off amp. So it should start to clip on both the positive and the negative peak at the same time. But you're going to take your, uh, your wave generator uh, uh, amplitude and just keep increasing it until you run out of swing on the output and you've hit the compliance. Back off. Look where you're at. Um, compliance is the maximum peak-to-peak -peak output without distortion. So um, definitely check that. And 
with that, of course, when you see, when you've reached the compliance of the amplifier, where you run out of room, it can, it can no, longer, no longer comply with the input. Um, like I say, back off a little bit, but then you also see what the maximum input voltage is. So, of course, remember that relationship, Vn max, is another characteristic so that we can we can um, we can get all those um, very easily with op amps um, uh, there's a lot more once again it was a lot more work with a with a discrete ce amplifier uh, and don't forget the relationship of course i think it's pretty obvious right your maximum input times your gain Uh, is always this compliance. And compliance is always peak to peak. So V and max would be peak to peak. Yeah. Okay. So this relationship uh, is there for you too as a review. Uh, if you want to know your V and max, well, you'll be able to look at it at the bench. But um, if you wanted to predict it, you would take your compliance that we predict of 8 volts peak to peak and divide it by the gain that we predict, right? So maybe that's worth doing. Let's do that. So here we have it. If we predict an 8 volt peak to peak compliance um, and a gain for that first configuration where it was a, an inverting, uh, a negative feedback amp, but, with, but an inverting amp, uh, our gain we had set up for 10. If we use 100K and a 10K, we get a gain of 10. Um, max input would be 0 0.8 or 800 millivolts. Peak to peak, that's peak to peak. Uh, remember the analog discovery input that you're putting in is, a, is an amplitude setting. Amplitude is always peak. Um, so uh, it'd be 0.8 volts peak to peak, but um, 0.4, 400 millivolts amplitude would be the most you can put in without hitting clipping. So, and one other quick note: um, this eight volt peak to peak compliance that we pre that we're predicting uh, is a fair prediction if you have a full five volts on the rails. The analog discovery I noticed uh, might come in a little shy of that. Well, it depends. If you're using an external power supply for the analog discovery, you can control and get exactly the five volts you want. Otherwise, you're at the mercy of the USB voltage. So whatever the USB port voltage is, that's what you've got. And it might be a little under 5 volts. So you might have to readjust um, your prediction here. Or you might just have to, that might be a bench thing. You might have to look at it and sort of adjust based on that. So if your USB voltage is a little under 5, your compliance isn't going to be 8 volts peak to peak. It's going to be a little less. You know, so probably safe to say we'd have 7 volts peak to peak, you know, which would give us 0.7, and we'd have 350 millivolts peak, or 350 millivolt amplitude would be the most you would set your signal generator for and before you would hit clipping on your output. You might even want to um, watch this video a second time. Uh, if you took some notes, um, or, if you're, or maybe you watched it and just kind of absorbed it, but then I would recommend watching it the second time and writing things down. Maybe the first time just gets you oriented, um, uh, however you want to do it, but, but um, probably watching it a second time and polishing up your notes um, because uh, these are the fundamentals that'll make playing with op amps easy. If you're missing any one of these important fundamentals, um, it won't be Lego world for you. It'll be frustrating. <laughs> so uh, make sure that uh, go ahead, watch it a second time, uh, polish up your notes, and then uh, go for the exercises. Um, but be sure you get these fundamentals down cold. And then we'll just be playing with a lot of variations from here on out.